Ah, talks at Google. The bastion of intellectual and cultural discourse too high-minded for the likes of TEDx. What exciting topic of discussion do we have today? Was the cat in the hat black? Well, no, he was black and white. I mean, look at his tail. Look at his feet. Look at his belly and face. The cat in the hat's fur was two-toned. Or are you talking about race? So, was the cat in the hat black? So, um, have we already encountered some queer characters? I mean, I don't know. Um, nobody mentioned Captain Hook, but <clears throat> the long curls and etc. And what on earth do I mean by that? Question. Well, I am pretty sure you mean to imply that the cat in the hat is, in some way, a representation of a black person. Though, I have a sneaking suspicion that you think there's even more to it than that. I mean, he's a cat, isn't he? Sure. He's a cartoon cat who walks upright, who wears a red and white striped top hat and a kind of garish bow tie, and carries an umbrella, but he's a, a cat. Probably. Maybe? There's no probably or maybe about it. It is a cartoon of an anthropomorphized cat. But do tell, what hidden meaning do you project into this self-chosen Rorschach inkblot? I'll answer my title question in a moment. But first, I should say that I've made the question, the title question, because, as Robin Bernstein has noted, racism sneaks into children's culture under the cloak of innocence, and once there, it continues to influence the broader culture. Racism. So, we've gone from, is this character a depiction, abstractly or otherwise, of someone from a particular race, to the cat in the hat promotes an ideology of racial supremacy. Wow, you covered a lot of territory there in a very short amount of time. Now, please offer me your best evidence. I am ready to be educated. I've made this the title of the book because racial and racist images persist in the cultures of childhood, often in ways that we don't notice on a conscious level. Right. The indoctrination into a racist ideology, by way of the cat in the hat, is subliminal, and is something only our speaker is smart enough to reveal. Got it. This is why, in children's books and culture, race is present, especially when it seems to be absent. Uh-huh. In children's books, and in culture, Race is present even when it seems to be absent. I'll just let that sink in for a second. Now, pardon me while I continue purging witchcraft from my neighborhood. What? You don't see witchcraft? Well, that's what the devil wants you to believe. And I am the pure one for pointing it out. And Dr. Seuss's The Cat in the Hat illuminates the ways in which images from the past continue to haunt the present, and apparently discarded racial ideas linger on. The Cat in the Hat is racially complicated, inspired by blackface caricature and by actual people of color. Blackface. Um, okay. One story of the book's origins. One story. So, there is more than one story. So, this isn't necessarily a true story. Got it. Is that in 1955, 
William Spaulding, director of Houghton Mifflin's educational division, thought that Dr. Seuss could solve the why Johnny can't read crisis by writing reading primers that children actually enjoyed reading, you know, instead of Dick and Jane, which children did not enjoy reading. Uh, they didn't? Because Dick and Jane books were sold for over four decades into the 1970s. But I'm sure the book sales and lasting recognition in American culture has nothing to do with their popularity back then. So, as Seuss rode the elevator up to Spaulding's office, he noticed that the elevator operator was a elegant, petite, African-American woman who wore white gloves and a secret smile. Her name was Annie Williams, and in response to Spaulding's challenge, write me a story that first graders can't put down, Seuss wrote The Cat in the Hat, giving the protagonist, Mrs. Williams, white gloves, her sly smile, and her color. And her color. So, Annie Williams was black and white-skinned? Right. Well, I'll tell you what. Even though your own framing of this origin story for the character is shaky, I'll stipulate to it completely. For the sake of argument, I'll concede that Seuss did model that cat's smile, gloves, and coloration on Annie Williams. And I'll ignore the fact that the cat is male, the fact that he wears a striped hat, the fact that he wears a bow tie. I'll even ignore the fact that the account we do have of that story only mentions the gloves and the smile and not the color. And I'll ignore that these are all characteristics that both outnumber and contradict the two actually recorded inspirations from Annie Williams. So, taking you at your word and ignoring everything else, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Why would Dr. Seuss choose to flatter someone he hated? A source for the cat's red bow tie is Crazy Cat, the ambiguously gendered creation of biracial cartoonist George Harriman. Oh, the bow tie comes from Crazy Cat. Well, what did Crazy Cat look like? Um... Uh-huh. So, are you sure that the bow tie was the only thing about Crazy Cat that inspired the cat in the hat's design. Seuss also draws on the traditions of minstrelsy, an influence that emerges first in a minstrel show that he wrote and performed in, in blackface, while in high school. In high school. In 1921. And this makes a children's book he published 36 years later, an exercise in racist propaganda. Got it. In fact, in fact, blackface minstrelsy recurs in Seuss's early cartoons, in 20th century popular culture, and its traces linger on in many other icons of children's literature. As Robin Bernstein says, and I'm going to quote her here at length, children's culture has a special ability to preserve even as it distorts and transmit even as it fragments the blackface mask and styles of movement, which persist not only in Raggedy Ann and the Scarecrow, but also in the faces and gloved hands of Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny. And to her list, we can add Seuss's cat. Mickey Mouse, Bugs Bunny, and the Scarecrow from the Wizard of Oz. They are all agents of racism. Got it. And what makes the cat so interesting and so representative and why he's the title of the book is that during the very same decade that The Cat in the Hat was published, Seuss was both speaking out against racism and recycling racist caricature in his books. Dr. Seuss spoke out against racism. Dr. Seuss created characters that promote racism. I don't think I can add anything to that to make it more plain just how shaky the foundation is on which our speaker has placed his argument. 
So in a 1952 essay, he pointedly critiques racist humor. In 1953, inspired by his opposition to anti-Semitism, he writes The Sneetches. And then, the same year as Brown v. Board of Education, the landmark Supreme Court case that ostensibly made school segregation illegal in the US, Horton Hears a Who presents the Who's smallness as an arbitrary mark of difference for which they are unfairly penalized. Arguing against anti-Semitism, promoting a person's value over aspects of their being that are not determinative of their character, and that second one in a book, I might add, which was published three years before The Cat in the Hat. Dr. Seuss makes for an awfully lousy racist. Our speaker here is losing me. I can only hope he swoops in with a zinger and quick. One review at the time said that Horton's refrain, a person's a person no matter how small, was, quote, a rhymed lesson in protection of minorities and their rights. And yet, in the same decade, in If I Ran the Zoo, Gerald McGrew proposes going to the African island of Yurka to bring back a tizzle-top tufted mazurka who sits on a perch, carried by two African men, and suggesting a kinship with animals. The two nearly naked Africans have tufts on their heads that resemble the tuft on the head of the birds. Their faces really seem to come straight out of Seuss's early cartoons. The same book offers a visit to the mountains of Zamba Matant with helpers who wear their eyes in a slant. Meanwhile, Scrambled Egg Super, also from the 50s, invites us to laugh at Ali, a gullible Arab being attacked by hundreds of angry Mount Struku cuckoos. Dr. Seuss's work is both racist and opposes racism, and does both in the same decade. Wow. Dr. Seuss was a man of many contradictions. Writing stories and creating characters inspired by different cultures that are, of course, meant to demonize and demean those cultures, all the while actively denouncing anti-Semitism and promoting the notion of common humanity despite individual differences. But Dr. Seuss was totally telling kids to be racist hate mongers, because our speaker says so. If you go looking for secret messages in the patterns of tree bark, if you seek to spot castles in the clouds, I'll bet that you'll find them. And if they make you happy, well, that's just fine. But don't suppose to tell me that not seeing what you see is proof that I am some morally defective beast. Because that would not be nice. No, not nice in the least. As always, thank you for watching.